Hi Weaving friends, it's great to be with you in another video. Today is a really great day, do you know why? Well, every day is a great day, but today especially is a great day because we are here together, you and I, and I'm going to be answering some of your questions. Before I begin, if you are brand new here, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Kelly and I'm an online weaving teacher. One of my favorite things to do is to talk about weaving and especially to talk about weaving with all of you because I know how much you love to hear it. If you are brand new, I'd love for you to take a moment to subscribe, like this video and click on the bell notification so that you are notified every time I post a new video. Okay, let's get into the questions. Now I do have a rather lengthy list here and I'm gonna be looking down at the list. If you see me looking down a lot, that's why. Oh, and I know that somebody is going to ask me what I'm wearing today. This is my Midnight Shawl and this, the pattern for this is available in the Etsy shop. It is a little more of an advanced pattern, so if you're only a beginner, maybe work up to something like this. And then I've got this gorgeous handcrafted shawl pin. It's made of wood and my sister-in-law purchased it in Tanzania many, many years ago. And it's absolutely beautiful, goes very well with my shawl. This shawl is made of wool and it's quite cool here today and I'm just toasty warm in this shawl. Perfect for when the weather's starting to turn cool like it is here in Australia. So grab a cup of tea. You know that when you're gonna spend a little bit of time with me, tea is always a good thing. I, of course, have my tea in my favorite mug. Okay, I'm ready to get started now. I'm gonna work through the questions in no particular order and these questions are almost all weaving related and some of them are related to other things. So I'm just gonna start at the top of my list and go through. Laureline, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, has two questions to ask. The first one is, how do I manage color changes on my weft? I made some stripes on the stole that I'm currently weaving and I'm not 100% happy with how my color changes look. I get asked this question a lot. I do have one video that sort of helps you to get your head around uh, one way that you could do your color changes if you don't want to be constantly cutting the weft. You should be able to see that video up ahead. It's, it's from my log cabin table runner pattern, but there's a free tutorial up there for you. So you need to make a decision usually based on a couple of things, the thickness of the yarn and the number of rows or picks that you're going to be weaving in between your repeats. So let's say I've chosen three colors, pink, white, and yellow, and I'm going to, I've already decided before I started weaving that I'm going to be weaving two rows of each color, so quite thin stripes. And my yarn is, let's say, a light worsted. So somewhat heavy, but not as heavy as you can get. Because there's only going to be three rows of that, of each color, I would definitely decide not to cut the yarn every time I want to change it at the weft. I would carry it up the sides of the project. The thing with cutting the yarn to change the color is you can tuck the tail in, but then that does introduce some amount of bulk, and I'll go over that in a moment. But if you can avoid that bulk, it's a good thing but sometimes you can't avoid the bulk if you want to do thicker stripes. So let's say I'm using that same yarn and I'm using the same colors, but this time I actually want to do, let's say 20 picks or 20 rows of each color for a thicker stripe of each color. Then I'm definitely going to cut the yarn. I'm going to tuck it into about the first three warp threads on one side. So I finish off the row that I'm doing. Let's say I'm in the down shed. I cut that yarn, leaving a little tail of a couple of inches. Then I go to the up shed. So that's the change of shed for me. I tuck into the up shed and then I can introduce the new yarn. Weave that pick, go into the down shed and then I tuck in the tail of the new yarn that I just introduced. It's a little hard to describe without actually showing it, but I think you'll understand what I mean. Now, if you're going to be cutting and tucking in a lot, a key thing to do 
is to make sure that you alternate the sides on which you're tucking in. So don't always be introducing yarn from the same side that you ended and tucked in the last tail. If you do that along the whole length of the project, say I only tucked tails into the left side of the project, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have this buildup of bulk on just the left hand side of the project and eventually it's going to affect the way my rows look. They're gonna be a little bit wonky and they're gonna be a bit raised towards that left hand edge. Another thing I wanna mention about the, um, about changing colors, if you decide to carry up the edge of the weft, you can actually make a design feature of that. As long as the floats don't end up too long at the edge, then you're going to have it, well, it doesn't look so nice. And also it's probably going to catch on things if the float is too long. It's gonna end up more like a loop than a little float that just goes in. So if you look at this example of my candy store scarf, now anytime I mention one of my patterns or classes or whatever I'm mentioning to give an example of the technique that I'm using, I'll link to that down below, you'll be able to find it. But with this candy store scarf, you can see that there's quite a few colors in this scarf. And so it really works to carry the colors up the side and have that as part of the design feature. So I'm not trying to hide the edges. I'm actually making a point with this scarf of going, hey, look at these edges. Don't they look interesting? They integrate into the project, if that makes sense. Okay, so Laureline's next question was, how do I manage multicolored warp? I mean, when you alternate two or more colors in the warp, do we need to cut the yarn between each color change? If so, what's the most efficient way to knot or hold it? So I know that a lot of people differ with me on the way that I do color changes in the warp, and that's absolutely fine. Something I should have said at the start of this video is, Whatever advice I give, it's my own opinion and the way that I like to do things. But that doesn't mean necessarily that it's the right way and that I'm the expert on it. It just means it's the way that I like to do it through my years of experience in weaving. But I know other people have other preferences and that's absolutely fine. It actually bothers me when people say, I don't know the right way to do this, or somebody told me there was only one way to do this and you have to do it that way. I totally disagree. It's, that's false. I want, what I want as a teacher for my students is, I show my ways of doing things. I want you to try those ways, but then I want you to practice and practice. And if you discover other ways, or if you come across other resources for different ways of doing things, and you prefer that way, there is no reason for you to continue with doing it my way. It's just common sense that you find the ways that suit you the best. Back to the question. This could be a long video because <laughs> I do get off topic a little bit, but let's get back to the topic. So my favorite way of managing color changes in a warp no matter how many color changes there are, whether it's whether I'm doing thick stripes in a warp or whether I'm doing thin stripes or whether I'm alternating all these different colors is, I like to cut the yarn and tie it off and tie on the new yarn. So that would be, I start out by tying the initial color onto the apron rod at the back of the loom. I tie that with just a very simple double knot. It doesn't go anywhere. I never have any trouble with yarn undoing its knots or anything like that. And then the next time I wanna change color, even if it's like two warp threads away, I cut the last one, I knot that on, and then I cut, and then I knot the new one on and, and start using that. And I do that every time I wanna color change. Some people will say that is a waste of time when you can just have all of these balls at the back of the apron rod and you can just keep them going continuously. True, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. The reasons that I like to tie it, to cut and tie for each new color is, number one, you end up with a better tension because you're not leaving off these certain yarns and then looping them around other yarns that you've already looped onto the bar you are cutting off and tying each section. It's almost like sectional beaming um, 
with a floor loom you'll get better tension because you're doing it in sections so each section of color has its own lot of tension I like that um, I always end up with really good tension when I do it that way and then the second thing is just to keep things orderly I myself would not like to have a bunch of different balls of yarn at the back of the loom and trying to manage them all looping around each other instead of knotting each section and having it laying side by side in its own section as you go along everything's straight and orderly you're not going to get twisted threads and loops going over each other and it just seems more complicated to me the other way yes I know it does take longer to tie off and, and re-tie re and all of that but that's my preferred method so that's my advice for that question all right now we're on to Joseph Joseph asks I have a 16 inch Ashford and I want to make a baby blanket of approximately 30 inches how do I attach the pieces of fabric together because I don't know how to sew it's actually pretty easy Joseph um, and I do have a pattern that does this very thing it's the rainbow blanket pattern so what I did for that pattern and what you can do on a smaller loom I actually did it on my Ashford samplet which is an only only a 10 inch weaving width so I, I warped the loom for um, to weave two to three panels at a time and each panel was a certain length I can't give you the exact um, length because I can't remember <laughs> but each one was um, around 10 inches wide a little less and a certain length and I wove them all to the same length so that I ended up with I think it was six maybe seven yeah well it's colors of the rainbow so seven panels and then at the end I, I took each of the panels and lay them parallel to one another and I used a mattress stitch I don't have any videos on mattress stitch I probably should but you will find it if you google it so it's a hand stitching and I used I just used warp thread for the stitching um, and that was each panel was a different color but the warp thread was all the same color it was white so I, I used the mattress stitch in that color to sew each panel together and then I hemmed the whole blanket as a whole so the answer to that Joseph is mattress stitch look it up it's not hard at all and it's very effective it's lovely Wendy asks I've just begun weaving and in my second project on a Cricut loom three of the warp threads all the way on the left became so tight that I can't go forward I'm not sure what I did or what I should do now I was thinking about this question for a while Wendy because it's a bit of a puzzler all I can think is that something has gone wrong in your warp perhaps um, when you were winding on your warp something got caught with those three threads they might have got caught on an apron tie or but then that's not so likely if you've got a cricket loom because I think they have string ties uh, I don't really know the answer to this question what I would be doing is if you've just begun weaving you can actually unroll your warp without losing the whole warp and you can unroll it just little by little from the back beam to see whether there's whether it, those threads have actually caught on anything because it is common to have warp threads of a different tension accidentally having a different tension because you've put more tension on certain warp threads as you are warping but to have it so tight that you can't actually advance the warp anymore that is a little bit different that would tell me that there's something wrong one thing I want to say is if something like this happens to you don't force your loom to try to act the way you would want it to normally act when you get these sort of signal warning signs that something's happening so if I'm advancing my warp and three of the threads are so tight that it doesn't want me to advance any further that's definitely alarm bells that there is something wrong it's and I'm not going to continue trying to advance because that could actually damage my loom so always try to investigate and go back through steps that you've already completed so that's kind of what I meant in unrolling the warp that you've already rolled on it's it's walking backwards to see 
um, if you can find any clues as to what's happened. I'm sorry I can't be more helpful with that one, but that's what I would recommend. Marilyn says, what is the best method to join color changes on a plaid cotton towel? The weft duplicates the warp pattern. Well, this is kind of similar to the question that we already had from Laureline about the multicolor warp um, and about the weft color changes. So I would say the same thing, Marilyn. Um, I would be looking at the thickness of the yarn, the thickness of your rows, a few color changes, and then I would make my decision based on that, whether I was going to carry the colors up the side or whether I was going to cut them. But definitely with a plaid, you want to have that balanced weave. So if you're cutting, have make sure that you're alternating the sides on which you enter with the new color so that you don't end up with buildup on both sides. Okay, the next question is from Kay, who describes herself as a fan. Thank you, Kay, <laughs> it's very nice. Kay says, I can't do the log cap and cabin pattern on my rigid heddle to save my life. You're the first one I go to for videos on what I'm trying to do. Couldn't find one by you and watched others which didn't work out well. Would very much appreciate a video on that. Okay, so to address that first part of the question, Kay, I do have a log cabin class. I've got a class on my online weaving school and I also have a pattern available. But if you're having trouble with log cabin, the thing about log cabin is I think it's quite um, visual, the, the setting up of the colors and everything. So if you are more of a visual learner, if you need to see things done to really understand them, then I would always recommend a video class over a PDF pattern. But if you're more of a confident weaver and you like to follow instructions on paper, PDF patterns are great. So yes, I do have a class and a pattern on doing log cabin. And the thing is, if you see my pattern with the, the log cabin table runner and you don't particularly like it, you can always use the pattern or the class for the technique for setting up your warp and for weaving it without actually weaving that project. You can make your own project out of it. For example, um, a lot of people use it to make scarves and that log cabin makes wonderful, beautiful scarves, really striking. And of course you get to choose your own colors and everything, you never have to follow the same colors that I've done. Okay, so the next part of Kay's question is also, I get what double weave is, but again, I can't figure it out on my rigid heddle loom. I've tried to add an extra heddle and that sure didn't work for me. Oh my gosh. Warping the slots was difficult enough, but the holes, no way. I've tried videos that suggest a sort of wooden buffer and several other, other methods. Okay, so the double weave's not working out for you. That's understandable because it's, it's a more advanced technique and it is pretty difficult to try and figure out on your own. So once again, I have a couple of classes that would definitely help you. The first one is I've got a weaving with two heddles class. That is more of a techniques class. So there's not actually a project with that one, but it shows you all the different things that you could possibly do with two heddles. And then the second one, if you want to actually weave a double width project is my double weave baby blanket, which is a really popular class. And I'm sure Kay that both of those classes or either of those classes would be a big help to you. I think the thing with something like weaving double width is you can't really understand or it's very hard to understand until you've got it all set up on your loom and you're actually weaving it. And even when you start weaving like the first couple of inches, your brain's not really getting it because you're like, oh, aren't I just weaving plain weave with a little bit of a difference? Like something's a little bit different, but you know, I've got these pickup sticks in and things are obviously different, but you're not really getting it. And then after weaving a few inches, I always tell people to stop and to insert their hand into the weaving so that you can feel both layers and you can feel your fold for the first time. And that's like a really thrilling moment because as I said, up until then, you can't really tell much what's going on. You don't know whether you're doing it right or not heard from so many students who say, oh, I've woven 10 rows and I just don't know if it's working. 
and I say keep weaving go for another couple of inches and then stick your hand in there and just about every time they get back to me and say wow it worked so yeah definitely go with the classes Kay from Wendy I just bought a 30 inch shacked loom I love rigid heddle looms would it be possible to learn how to use a double heddle to make it like a three or four shaft loom thank you again for all your information well yes Wendy this is one of the great things about a rigid heddle loom is that they are so much more than meets the eye initially so you buy your loom and it comes to you and you put it together and you have a basic rectangular frame with one heddle in it and it all seems like a pretty simple setup and it is but there's so much more that you can do than just your plain weave so you can make it into a three four five six seven eight shaft loom if you really want to go that far I haven't gone that far I've gone up to four shafts um, maybe I'll do more shafts sometime just as a personal challenge but definitely th making it into a three and four shaft lo loom is very doable and heaps of fun so with two heddles you can weave three shaft patterns and with three heddles you can weave four shaft patterns then you've got all of your pickup sticks you can use your heddle rods and that sort of thing in addition to your extra heddles or even with just one heddle and extra pickup sticks and heddle rods to make those extra shafts to weave more complex patterns once again I have classes oh I've got a bunch of classes um, that would pertain to these if you go to my online weaving school one of probably one of the most popular classes for what you're asking is I already mentioned the weaving with two heddles class but there's also converting um, drafts to your he rigid heddle loom that's been a really popular one and it focuses more on using a heddle in combination with pickup sticks and heddle rods now someone might ask why would I choose to use two heddles or instead use one heddle with pickup stick and heddle rod the most simple answer is really when someone wants to try to do more complex patterns on their rigid heddle loom and they haven't tried it before they don't necessarily want to make the investment of buying extra heddles which is understandable so by setting up pickup sticks and heddle rods it's a very cheap very cheap way to start weaving those more complex patterns now my personal preference if I'm going to do more complex patterns is to use more heddles but that's me because I have more heddles I'm a teacher so I have all of these extra equipment and things that I need but if you just want to give it a try and you maybe you don't have, it's not within your budget to make the extra investment to, for buying new heddles they are expensive you can go for the pickup sticks or heddle rods for um, for next to nothing so I hope that helps with your question Wendy next question is from Elizabeth my question for you is regarding the paper used when winding on a warp how do you get it to go on straight I'm a newer weaver and I'm having a devil of a time with it no matter how hard I try it has a mind of its own and it wants to go wonky and roll up on one side leaving my threads barren on the other end I have now lost two projects due to that problem and I'm becoming fairly frustrated yeah it is frustrating <laughs> um, my first piece of advice is the paper that you're using if you can use a paper that's slightly heavier rather than a lighter one I've got this whole roll of craft paper but it's quite light so I have a problem where it kind of if I don't pay extra attention it crumples a little bit when I'm winding on my warp and that annoys me so you don't want it as like stiff as cardboard but a paper that's a little bit heavier is good it's not going to move around as much and it's going to be more stable as you wind on the warp um, another thing is I've found it helpful to have a little bit of tension on the paper so if you've got a roll of paper if you can you pop the paper in and you start to wind it on make sure that you get it really wedged in there to start with before you go ahead with the whole winding get it wedged in there pull it a little to make sure that it's nice and taut put it in as straight as you can and then if you have the warp, have the roll of paper coming out behind the loom 
then then hopefully there's a little bit of tension on that paper and it's not just kind of billowing up and free to do its own thing you've got to keep it under control while you're winding take plenty of time with your winding on your walk too don't be in a hurry to get it done and do it in steps if you can so you're holding your walk you're winding and then you want to go back to the paper after a couple of winds and you want to pull tug on the paper to make it taut again and when you're tugging it you can make sure that you're tugging it straight down so that it keeps that straight angle then readjust the tension on the paper if you can it could even help that if you're not using a whole roll of paper so you don't have that weight to hold the paper down you could put a heavy book on it or something like that so that it's just staying taut but yeah that would be my best advice don't try to do your warping winding it on all in one step just to get it on there it's the more attention you pay in the warping process the less headaches you'll have later on and you'll be thankful that you spent the extra time Deirdre asks I'm still not good at measuring while weaving the pattern tells me to do 20 inches should I measure when in neutral position or how I have a rigid head or loom um, I always measure, I've got my own way of doing this, I extend the apron rod at the back of the loom out fully, so take the brake off, extend it right out, put the brake back on so it's out as far as it goes. And then I'll grab my tape measure and you can even move your heddle out of the way temporarily if you need to, to measure it towards your warping peg. So I measure from the apron bar all the way to the warping peg I don't go around the peg or anything just measure to the peg and that should be absolutely fine that should be your 20 inches Lisa asks I want to know what the difference in waist yarn on a rigid heddle loom and your new loom is um, and I'm just going to assume that you're talking about my table loom here because that's the newest loom that I've got and what sizes of yarn you can use on your new loom so to answer the first question there's a little more waste with a table loom with the yarn um, but not a lot and that's all calculated in the beginning when you do your calculations sheet I don't have the figures here but I would say it's just a few inches extra of waste probably around four inches it's not a huge difference what sizes of yarn can be used on my new loom well the standard loom and this is my Ashford 8 shaft table loom that I'm talking about it comes standard with a 10 dent reed and so uh, the thickest yarn I would use on it would be a fingering weight and you can go to a pretty fine yarn on that you just have to um, adjust when you're slaying the reed to put in enough enough threads and also when you're doing your calculations at the beginning to make sure you have enough threads to make up that set that you're after she also asks the time factor from start to finish does it equal about the same between the rigid heddle and the table loom no <laughs> um, so I say with time factors of setting up the loom you've got um, your really basic little frame looms um, you know on the little tapestry frame looms that are really simple they're the quickest to set up and then you've got your rigid heddle looms next quickest then you've got your table looms then you've got your floor looms um, so the table loom does take more time to set up than the rigid heddle loom you're usually using more than two shafts if you're using a table loom not always you can just use two shafts if you want to but considering that you're usually using four to eight shafts on your table loom that takes more time to thread all those little heddles and then you have to thread the reed you see when you when you're threading the rigid heddle you're threading the slots and then you're threading the holes or if you're using double threads you can actually thread the holes and the slots at the same time which is a real time saver but it's all very quick and it's very simple um, on a larger loom you are it's a similar process but it does take longer each heddle is on its own shaft and you have to make sure that you've got all the right shafts and that sort of thing and then once you have all of those heddles threaded then you have to slay the reed as well before you can actually tie on and start weaving so yeah table loom definitely takes longer than the rigid heddle loom Heather asks I have a rigid heddle loom 
and I want to weave my family tartan. I know I have to use a 2212 for it to officially be a tartan. I'm learning how to convert a four shaft loom pattern to rigid heddle so I can weave the 2212. Any help with that would be great. The book I have also said for a two shaft loom that a tabby would be fine. I thought I would start with tabby and work up to the twill. Tabby is just another name for plain weave. What I really need help with is setting up the warp in the set pattern to the twill setup. Can you explain about that even if it's explaining about the four shaft loom setup? Okay so once again I think the easiest thing is I can't really explain these things on camera here. I need to show them and actually do them and the best thing for me to do when people ask me questions like this is to refer them to the classes that I've already made um, that sort of explain all of these techniques otherwise I'm explaining to a thousand different people in a thousand different ways according to the specific project that they want to do. I think it's really lovely Heather that you want to weave your family tartan that's a lovely project to be doing um, and once again I recommend my converting drafts to the rigid heddle loom or weaving with two heddles would also be helpful. Neither of those are specific to tartan but they will show you the ways that you can adapt your draft to the rigid heddle loom. Ginger says my question is how do you change a rigid heddle draft into a floor loom draft? I actually had another student asking me this just yesterday. Um, what I told her was first of all if you have a rigid heddle loom book um, I'm going to use Jane Patrick's rigid heddle weaving book as an example because that's one that I have and I know that she presents drafts in the pickup section. So if you have a book like that and you're looking at a particular pattern and it's got the instructions for the pattern for how to do the pickup and then how to weave whatever the pattern is and then it's got a little draft next to it so a, a typical weaving draft. If you're just starting out in rigid heddle weaving don't worry about the draft. The draft is more for what Ginger is asking if you want to convert it to a table loom or a floor loom. But if you just want to weave the pattern on your rigid heddle loom follow the instructions you don't need to worry about the draft. But as far as how to convert the draft into a floor loom draft you need to have a really good understanding of drafting to be able to do that. There is a book um, by Marilyn Vanderhoot and it's very comprehensive. It's not easy going so but if you're really interested in delving into learning more how to put your own drafts together I really recommend that book. I have it myself. Once again it's not something that I can easily explain and it's something that I'm still exploring myself a lot. There's a ton that I, that I want to learn about pattern drafting myself. Um, I think it's probably one of my biggest challenges as a weaver to understand and get my head around and I have done quite a bit of research but I would like to devote more time to that and really just make myself a, a student of pattern drafting for a while so that I can get it stuck in there. Uh, I'm pretty confident with basic drafting and but not necessarily with converting from rigid heddle to floor loom. But Ginger you may be interested in taking a look at that book. Sharon asks don't laugh but the one weaving action that gives me the most problems is how to change the wefts and make the change as invisible as possible especially when you're changing colors or adding a completely different weft yarn. Okay so I wouldn't laugh Sharon of course this is a very common problem um, as you can probably tell because two of the other questions already have been sort of related to that. So you can uh, go back near the beginning of the video when I already talked about doing weft color changes. Crystal says what is the next step after plain weaving? I find pick up stick work intimidating but I want to progress a bit. I always say that the next step after plain weaving is pick up sticks but I think if pick up sticks are intimidating or if you're worried about trying them you can start with color and weave which is basically combining colors to create patterns in your 
weaving. I have a blog post that I've written about this that explains exactly what it is and gives some really good examples of it. So you may be interested in that blog post. I'll link it down below. That is a fun way to get patterns because color and weave, most color and weave, you're still doing plain weave, but you're setting up the color in the warp and then you're coordinating color in the weft to make patterns. And actually you can make the most interesting and beautiful patterns while still just doing plain weave. Now you say that you find pick up stick work intimidating. I'd like to know what you find intimidating about it. And I'd like to know whether you've actually tried it yet because sometimes we can build up in our minds something to be more difficult than it actually is. And then when we try it, we think, well, what was all the fuss about? The great thing about pickup sticks is they're so open to experimentation. You can grab a pickup stick. If you know how to warp your rigid heddle loom and you've got it warped for plain weave, you can put a pickup stick in there very easily and do random patterns and just play around with it and see where it takes you. I have a couple of videos here on YouTube. I'll put cards for them up above somewhere. One's about how to use a pickup stick, but then I have a couple of other tutorials that actually use pickup. And you'll see that it's really basic. The only thing you need to remember is to always have your heddle down in the down position to pick up behind the heddle because you need to pick up slot threads and not whole threads. You don't want to have too many huge gaps between the threads, the warp threads that you've picked up because that will give you too long floats. The most basic pickup pattern to start with is just one up, one down. So you're just putting your pickup stick in, you're putting it underneath the first warp thread, over the second, under, over, under, over, across the back of the warp. And from there, you can make some interesting patterns. Then once you've mastered that, you can experiment with doing one up, two down, one up, two down, whatever. But just to, to play around with it and get used to them, they're a great, affordable and easy way to start doing patterns on your rigid huddle loom. Uh oh, my tea's gone cold. I've been talking too much. The second part of Crystal's question was, what are the advantages and disadvantages for a stick versus boat shuttle for rigid heddle loom? The boat shuttles seem very expensive. Mm -hmm. And are they really worth the investment? Well, this is another one of those things where the jury's out. Some people love using a boat shuttle with their rigid heddle loom and others don't. I'm one who doesn't. So anytime I use my rigid heddle loom, I don't use a boat shuttle. I only use the boat shuttle on my table loom and my floor loom. The most basic reason is that you can't get the same tension on a rigid heddle as you can on the other looms. So my vision of the most effective way to use a boat shuttle is that you put it in one side when you've opened your shed and you shoot it across to the other side. That's the beauty of a boat shuttle. But with a rigid heddle loom, the tension is not usually good enough. So when I open up the shed, if I try to shoot it across, it'll usually take a dive. It's also a bit bulkier, though you can get low profile boat shuttles that are, are a bit thinner. Um, and often when I'm using my rigid heddle loom, I am using thicker yarns. That's just what I tend to do on the rigid heddle. And so the thicker yarns, it's going to take you longer to wind up all of those bobbins and put them in your boat shuttle than it is to just wind up a stick shuttle by hand. So that's my preference. Sometimes if I'm weaving with a, a finer thread, say an 8-2 cotton or finer on my rigid heddle loom, then I might take the time to use the boat shuttle and take the time to wind all of those bobbins. Otherwise, I don't. And it's true, boat shuttles are expensive. They can be, there are all different pricings on them, depending on what they do and different types. But you usually receive two stick shuttles when you buy your rigid heddle loom. And that is, they're absolutely fine to go on with for as long as you want to. There is actually no need to spend the extra money to get the boat shuttle unless you really, really want to. Next question's from Lisa. I've been thinking about a double weave baby blanket and tried my hand at it in a sample size. Always a really good idea 
when you're trying a new technique, something like double weave, to do a sampler. Excellent idea. It took me a long time to understand. Your video helped a lot. But it was only when I sat down at my loom that I really began to comprehend what was happening. It's just what I was saying before. I chose a very simple striped warp in a single color weft and it worked out, but honestly, I don't really know why. I ended up with a pretty random stripe, but in my project, I would have liked to have more control over the result. I think the only thing that you really need to think about when, if you're doing a striped warp for a double width weave for something like a blanket is to be careful at the fold and so you need to calculate so that at the fold your color widths are all going to match up depending on whether you're doing it really stripey or just one single stripe or whatever but the thing is at your fold you do have extra threads so you need to do if you're doing um say a say two inch stripes in your warp if you get to the fold side you might need to do a one inch stripe there because when you fold it out it'll actually be two inches if that makes sense just on the fold that's all you really need to pay attention to um, otherwise it's like doing stripes for a normal warp lisa also says i have a nice book with many patterns in it but i am not sure how to convert them so i can make them on my 24 inch loom i think it might help me if you could explain a bit about converting and or changing patterns when you want to make something in double weave. So this is not something that I've really explored myself. It's something that I really would like to, but I've really only done plain weave so far in double width weaving. Um, I haven't explored patterns at all. It's something that I do intend to do, so I can't really advise you too much on that. Um, I believe there are some articles on the internet though, perhaps on places like Interweave, um, the Schacht website may have some information. If you Google, you may find some helpful articles. Sorry, I can't be of more help with that one. Uh, okay, the next question, or there are a few questions here, is from Lynn. Lynn is a new student and she is really, really enthusiastic about weaving, which is awesome to see. You know, when I have students who are so enthusiastic and so happy to be weaving, it really inspires me and it makes me feel excited too. I love it. So Lynn says, how you dye cotton and wool yarn? What products or types of dyes you use? I'm a huge fan of your pastel colors and rainbows. This would be a very nice course idea, hint, hint. I know, <laughs> I do intend to make a course specifically on dyeing sometime. It's on the list, the long, long list of, of courses I need to make. Um, I am a natural dyer and have played with acid dyes for wool. Lynn's actually showed me some of her natural dyeing and it's really beautiful. So um, how I dye cotton and wool? Well, if you're brand new to dyeing, um, for cotton, you need to use a fiber reactive dye and for wool, you need to use an acid dye. Those are the two basics to start with. So um, not just cotton, let's say any plant fiber, you use fiber reactive and any animal fiber, you use an acid dye. Um, what products I use? Well, I actually use Australian products. So that's not as relevant to a lot of you who are in other countries, but I'm happy to give the specifics. Um, for wool, I use landscape dyes and I get them from Craft Color. And for cotton, for cotton, actually, I've often gotten fiber reactive dyes from Dharma Trading in the US. I don't do that anymore because the shipping is an absolute killer and so is the um, dollar conversion rate. So, but yeah, if you are in the US, Dharma Trading is awesome. The next question is how to thread a heddle with yarn doubled. In brackets, she's got 8-2 cotton doubled in 10 dent reed for dish towels. Well, thankfully, this is really simple. You've got your 10 dent reed and you want to double, which means you will have a set of 20. And all you need to do is go about your warping as you normally would, but instead of going through the slots twice to get your doubled yarn, you can go through the hole once with one end. So you're pulling one loop through the hole, going to your peg, and then coming back and pulling the next loop through the slot that's right next door to the hole. And that gives you doubled ends and you, you don't need to do any extra threading with that. 
Lynn's next question is about where in Australia that you live, how you spend your weaving days, where you fit it in, and where do you go to find weaving inspiration? First part of the question, I live in an outer suburb of Melbourne, Australia. It's not actually where I want to live, but um, we're grateful to be here and we have our own home. Our main aim is to move back to the country where my husband and I were originally from and to have a bit of land and be able to raise animals and basically do what we do here, but on a grander scale. Our youngest two daughters are also great horse lovers and they're pretty good riders as well and we would love to have love for them to have their own horse so that is our major goal at the moment it's a little bit on hold at the moment for obvious reasons because everything is on hold but we still hope to achieve that goal depending on what happens over the next year or two how I spend my weaving days well I don't actually have weaving days because I'm a homeschooling mum and I run a business and I do lots of other things as well. Thankfully, my husband is currently home full time. Thank God. And so things are a little easier now that I have the extra help, but still I can't just take an entire day to do weaving. So my days are usually divided into sections. Mornings are for homeschooling. Um, I spend a lot of time in the kitchen making food from scratch and that sort of thing and then usually later in the afternoons and then right into the evenings is weaving and work time it's an interesting life for me because my weaving is also my work so it's hard to make boundaries because um, i love doing the weaving but a lot of work comes along with it and most of the time when i'm weaving it is for my business it's not my own personal weaving so it's tricky, but I'm very blessed to be doing something that I absolutely love doing and to have, be a, have been able to actually create a business out of it that now supports our family. Huge blessing and something that I never imagined happening. The last part of Lynn's question was, where do you go to find weaving inspiration? Well, I don't think I need to go anywhere because weaving inspiration or inspiration of any sort is everywhere everywhere it can be a color it can be the light coming in the window it can be the leaves of that plant that I'm looking at right now out my bedroom window it can be a flower it can be somebody's pin on my Pinterest board it can be something that somebody says and it makes me think yeah inspiration is not something that I have a problem with at all oh and I should mention books I'm a big book reader and I love all kinds of books. So books are very inspiring to me as well. So Lynn's next question is how to, and is it possible to use yarns of different sizes on the same warp, which has been a total disaster for me? Well, yes, you definitely can. And there's all different ways of doing this for different effects. Some weaving companies have um, a heddle that you can buy, it has different dents within the same heddle, or it has little plates that you can take out to make this section 10 dent, this section 5 dent, this section 10, that section 5, so that you can actually use those yarns within the heddle without too many different problems. You could still use a thinner yarn and then a thicker yarn in the same heddle, as long as the yarn wasn't too thick for that particular heddle, and you would get different effects. The next question I have from Lynn again is, if you're trying to decide what yarns to buy that will get the most use and most bang for the budget, would you get cotton cone yarn, wool yarn? I'm currently a very lucky recipient of all the cone threads my experienced weaving friend has donated to me. So I have to get creative with the variety of cotton, wool, heavy versus light, etc. That's why my projects can be pretty unique. I use what I have and I add a little at a time. It's just hard to choose the next purchase as it's an investment. Yes, well, I think a lot of weavers fall into this category and certainly I did, especially when I was just starting out weaving. I was on a very tight budget. I didn't have a business then, so I wasn't actually making any money from my weaving. And so I had to look at creative ways of being able to get the materials that I wanted for the right price. One thing that I will say is that if you're just a beginner, don't think that you need to use the best and most expensive yarns. Use what you can get a hold of. If you are in the situation like Lynn is and someone has blessed you with free yarn, use it as much as you can and find as many different ways to use it as you can. 
and that'll be a really great practice for you so that when you do want to weave a really special project eventually you'll have the right experience and you won't be so stressed about spending money on the yarn. Also another really great thing to do that I still do to this day is that I buy bulk wool direct from the mill. This can be a really affordable way of doing it and depending on the mill you may be able to get different types. So um, for example I buy a lot of yarns from Bendigo Woolen Mill. They're fairly local to me um, but I get the yarns all sent to me in the mail and they have a variety of wools and cottons and then some other fibers at times as well. But the thing is that they have these gigantic balls of yarn for really great prices and I'm happy because it's an Australian product and I've found so many uses for these different yarns. Also if you go to a weaving shop or a yarn supply store make sure you find out if they have a discount section. So for example the mill that I buy from they also have a famous back room where if you actually go to the shop they will put their discounted or discontinued yarns right in this back room of the shop and you can pick up some amazing bargains there. And a lot of other shops will have the same a similar thing, yarns that they want to get rid of that will be useful to you. I've said it before but knitting yarns are really great for starting out with and I still use knitting yarns all the time in my weaving. This is made with knitting yarns. So they tend to not be as expensive as weaving yarns and they also tend to be thicker which is great for more beginner levels because they will weave up quickly and they're easy to use. Judith says perhaps you could tell us more about your journey to becoming more self-sustained. What led you to do so? Well it's kind of interesting because we never really thought about our lifestyle as being a particular way like self-sustainable or um, simple or frugal or anything. Those terms are sort of things that I found later through reading and so on. But what led us to that particular lifestyle was necessity. Um, when we were married I was 23, my husband was 22 and within a year our first child was born and we were renting at the time. We were both working but after my son was born obviously I couldn't work for a little while and there were times where my husband didn't have a stable job. We also didn't have that much direction in terms of what we were going to do with the rest of our lives but we started living in these um, particular simple and very frugal ways in order to save money. As our first child grew we knew that we wanted to provide our future children with a home of our own that was really important to us and we knew that for that we would have to have money in terms of a large deposit in order to get a home loan and so it became essential for us to save money and it's really hard to save money when you have a very small income as many of you already know and so that was really what the impetus for us finding the cheapest and most simple way to do things. Later on years later I came to appreciate the things that we were doing more because as we began to pay off our mortgage after we bought our first home and we started to be in a better financial position even though I had chosen not to work and, with our, and stay home with our subsequent, subsequent children so that we could homeschool we were still on a really tight budget but we were edging our way in. We were paying off that mortgage, chipping away at it bit by bit and getting ourselves gradually into a better financial position. And so the frugal and simple ways that we had really become accustomed to just became things that we would do because a lot of them were just common sense that you would fix something rather than throwing it out and buying a new thing that you if you wanted something you wouldn't buy it on a credit card you would save the money for it. These are just things that we think are really good and positive ways to live as well and if you find yourself eventually in a better financial position you come to really appreciate those ways and also another thing about being in a better financial position is I think you become more aware of your responsibility to help others and so if you have an extravagant lifestyle you could essentially be using money that could go towards other people and purposes that are much more fruitful than just satisfying your own material desires. So I could talk about that a whole lot more but 
I guess that's the simple answer if we don't want to be here all day. <laughs> okay, so now I've got a question from Susan and she says, I'm struggling continually with color, not knowing which colors work well together when they're woven into one fabric. I would also love to know where to find pattern drafts. What are the best resources? Okay, I'll um, address the first part of the question first before I go on. So yes, color can be very difficult for a newer weaver. You can have a look at the color wheel and sort of familiarize yourself with, you know, which colors are complementary and which ones are not likely to go together. Another really useful exercise can be if you have a few paints at home, even if they're only primary colors, is to mix up different colors or put different colors next to each other and see how they look on paper, whether they complement each other and then mix them together on the paper and see what happens when you have a stroke of red and a stroke of yellow or then what happens if you put a bit of blue on that or whatever and see whether the colors look good together or whether they look kind of messy or whether they look muddy or that sort of thing. Um, another really good exercise can be to make a color card and I go over this in my color confidence class but it's basically you can get a little white piece of card or any color of card and you can wrap it with different colors in different widths and just see how they all look together. If you do a bunch of different color wraps on those cards using varying colors that you may have, you'll, you'll notice when you put them all together that your eye might be attracted to certain ones. And the reason for that is that um, one, that's your preference for those colors, but also those colors go well together or they look good together. So that can be a useful exercise as well. Um, another useful piece of equipment, though it's not at all necessary and I don't have one, but just in, re in reference to this question is perhaps you would like to use a swatch maker or make your own swatch maker. They're, they're just a tiny small little loom where you can warp it up quickly and cross it with some colors in, in a plain weave just to see how they're going to look before you actually begin your project. Um, and then the third thing you could do is to look at weaving a sampler before you begin any project as well. You can make your sampler pretty small um, and you don't have to use a lot of yarn, but it can be very, very useful if you're really unsure about colors. Um, and then Susan says, I'm still a newbie and I would love to know the difference between warping the loom from front to back versus back to front. Are there advantages? to either. Well, when I'm warping my table loom or my floor loom, I always warp back to front. That is just my preference and I'm not really sure whether there's any specific advantage to doing it the other way. It just seems to make sense to me to, to warp back to front and I like the way of then coming to the front of the loom to thread the heddles and the reed and everything but other people prefer it to do it to the opposite way and it's another one of those things where you just need to try out um, both ways if you're interested to see which one suits you better. Of course if you're warping a rigid heddle loom my favorite method is direct warping because it's so fast and easy. And then Susan says and what about temples? Should I use one every time I weave or only with certain weave structures? You are always so creative about making your own accessories for the loom. I wonder if you know a good way to make a do-it-yourself temple. Well, um, I have a couple of temples, but I didn't make them. I bought them. Um, I think if you were handy with wood, you could probably do it, but I'm not sure what you would use for the metal teeth because you need to have metal teeth on either end. Those are what go into the cloth and keep it at an even level. Um, but as far as using temples and them being essential, hmm, I've experimented with my temples a fair bit and more often than not, like 99% of the time now, I choose not to use them. That just may be the way that I weave, that I find that I just don't need them as much. Um, perhaps the way that I weave, I, I don't have as much drawing I, I don't know what it is but or maybe I just don't tend to weave the sort of structures that do draw in so much that you need to have a temple but um, the times that I've used them I've found them to be a bit of a nuisance I know a lot of people swear by their te temples and they won't weave without them and that's great if you want to do that and you find that it really helps you 
for me uh, I'd rather give them a miss most of the time and that may change too because you know I'm my weaving is always changing always evolving I'm always learning maybe in the future I'll be like mm, I was so silly to not weave with the temple all of that time but just from from my current experiments I'm not that fond of them now this this one is from Christy. I know a bit about your great family. I follow Gemma on YouTube, but I would love to know more about your garden and your vegetable garden. By the way, Gemma is my daughter. She has a YouTube channel. She's a musician. Um, I live in a house with a great big ground, but we have very bad weather where I live, Portamont in Chile, and I have not taken advantage of the land as I would like. We have a beautiful garden with many trees and herbs with a great view of the Osorno volcano, but not a vegetable garden. So something that sort of stood out to me from this question, Christy, was that you say you have a beautiful garden with many trees and herbs. That tells me that your soil and your climate must be okay for growing things, especially if you can grow herbs, you should be able to grow vegetables as well without too much trouble but if you're concerned about the weather what I would recommend is first of all to start very small don't try to do the whole thing sometimes on the internet you'll see people have built these massive structures and they've never done a vegetable garden before and it all looks very beautiful but I do wonder if they're going to stick at it or if it's going to be too much work or if they lose interest just um, start small because you don't have to start large. So your vegetable garden can be something like getting a large pot and filling it with good soil and putting a few simple seeds in there. Find out what grows best in your region because I can't really advise you and say, oh, you know, grow radishes and um, spinach and um, kale and things like that that grow fairly well here and they may not grow well in your climate see what seeds are available in your region and if you can get in contact with other growers in your region and see what they're growing that's the best way to know and they'll also give you tips um, on the best ways to manage your weather there as well we do have some really challenging weather here in australia as well because the area that i live in it gets pretty cold in winter but it can get blastingly and horribly hot in summer and so we can grow all year round but that doesn't mean that we'll have success all year round so you have to learn to adapt to where you're living and the conditions and sort of plan ahead and be prepared to experiment but definitely definitely if you start with a large pot it's advantageous for a few reasons it's not a huge area to commit to and you can move it around so if the weather is a problem you can hopefully move it out of the weather to an undercover area or something if you need to and just see how it goes just play and have fun and you know and experiment carol says i would love to see a video on winding a warp and then winding it on a floor loom you probably have already done that i just haven't seen it yet i have done it actually so um my introduction to floor loom weaving class is on my online weaving school and that takes you through the entire process everything you would need to know so I'll refer you to that one and it'll be linked down below Karen says I'm doing my first indirect warp and I used a yarn ball winder to wind off what I thought would be enough thread to warp with two threads at once I definitely underestimated and ran out halfway through warping I had to cut the thread from the spool to wind off more thread. What's the best way to attach both threads to start warping again? It's really easy. When you're using a warping board or a warping frame, you can finish off and attach new threads very simply. The only rule is don't do it in the middle of your warp. Do it at either the starting peg or the last peg that you're winding around. So and that way that makes it really adaptable because you can just cut the thread where you need to so say you're going to um, do it at the starting peg you've run out of thread and your thread is just a little bit longer than the starting thread but not enough to go around and through the cross again 
So you just finish that thread there and you can basically do a double knot, tie on a new thread to that one and then just keep going as though nothing had happened. You want to make your knot, you know, so probably so that it's sitting on, on that starting peg if possible, then you won't risk having any knots in your actual warp as you're going along. Giselle says, if I'm warping a rigid heddle loom alone, I always have problems with the tension. I don't experience this problem with my floor loom and when I had a table loom I didn't have any problems there either. Can you go over how to get good even tension on a rigid heddle loom? I usually direct warp, maybe that's my problem. Well I always direct warp on my rigid heddle loom. It's one of the reasons I love it because it's so much faster than doing an indirect warp. But there are definitely things that you can do to help get better tension when you're warping alone. The first thing is if your if your project is anything wider than say a scarf um, 9 to 10 inches width use more than one peg um, you can pick up extra pegs pretty cheaply and so that way you can spread your warp instead of it all going to one point you can imagine if your warp is wider you can imagine that these outer threads over here traveling to this point are going to be at a different tension to the middle threads traveling to that point. So if you use two or even three warping pegs, one there, one there, if you want to divide your warp in half that way, then you're more likely to have your threads going in, traveling in, in a similar distance and you'll be able to um, adjust your tension and keep it, hopefully keep it good that way a little bit easier. Um, another thing is to, if you have a wider warp as well, you may want to look at weighting the warp in sections, um, especially if you're warping on a long table. You can actually weight it with hooks and um, milk bottles or whatever you can find that's a good enough weight. Some people use a hammer and weighting that over the end of the table putting the same amount of weight on each section that you're weighting. Um, so that way your warp is all spread out before you and it's all sitting there hanging over the end of the table at a similar tension. That may help. Another thing is to make sure that you use good separators as you're actually winding the warp on. So my preference these days is for a roll of paper. And we discussed paper before rolling on with paper that um, I was saying a, a slightly thicker paper is a really good idea. That really helps with tension as well and making sure that you are keeping that tension and even tugging at times if you're using a, a paper roll because then that really creates that friction of the paper moving back that way and the yarn moving against it so it all tightens up really nicely. The main aim is that you want the warp to be the width across the width as evenly tensioned as possible not as tightly tensioned as possible necessarily just an even consistent tension so what, look at ways of doing that and think about the way that you've been warping on your own do you think that the threads over to the right are being rolled on at the same tension as the threads in the middle or to the left just have a think about the way you're doing it and from what I've mentioned see if there's anything else there that you could try that would help with that problem. Haley asks getting wool on a rigid heddle or even acrylic tensioned correctly and the wool to stay straight and not crisscross as you advance your warp on a foreshaft as well as also ideas using your stash instead of spending money. Okay, so I just addressed the tensioning, um, but getting crisscross threads. So crisscross threads are on a four shaft without actually seeing what you're, what the problem that you're having, Haley. Um, I can only kind of imagine what's happening. But basically, when you're indirect warping, as you do for a four shaft loom, you need to make sure that you are using a rattle to order the threads. That's basically what the rattle is for is to space and order the threads. So you're getting your end loop from your warp chain 
around the end of your apron bar from the back beam and you and they can be a bit tangly they can be over each other and and not really looking like they're in much order they're just a loop of a massive threads all together but once you start putting them out into the rattle they should all be on the bar they should space out and should all be ordered sequentially so that they're not crossing over and everything so I, I think maybe the problem that you're having is in that part of the process that that early sort of warping stage of um, just getting the threads sorted and in order if there's one thing I've learned from weaving on a floor loom and a table loom it's that if your threads are kept in order your process will be smooth and easy Lorna says I have an eight shaft table loom when I warped it it seemed fine but halfway through the project some of the warp threads became really loose when I looked closely they seemed to be crossed a bit at the back beam how do I stop this happening this really ties into the last question doesn't it I'm a novice at table loom so maybe it's just practice not sure if that was what was making some of the warp threads floppy either or if that was a different problem is it fixable too okay so I think that what I um, just said to Haley in regards to her question really applies to you too Lorna that getting that order so that they're not looping over each other because looping over each other yes that means that they're not sitting straight on the bar and then they're not being warped under the same tension as every other thread and then that comes out in the weaving process so yes it is fixable the lesser threads that it happens with the easier it is to fix so if you're warping and you notice one or two looser threads and you know this happens to me from time to time as well I will grab an S hook and I will weight it over the back of the beam and I would just grab that that is loose put the S hook in um, through that thread so it sort of loops through the thread and then it hangs off the back beam and that provides a beautiful amount of tension for that and you can do that to as many threads of you as you need to as long as you have the weights you, you can have plenty of weights hanging off your back beam that is a quick fix and it really works Teresa asks when using a warping board how much additional yarn is needed due to tying on both ends of warp rather than only one when direct warping I know it seems silly like I should be able to figure this out but I don't trust myself it's not silly there are no silly questions I keep saying that to people but <laughs> there are no silly questions it's how you learn who are you going to ask how are you going to find out if you can't ask somebody so um, this if you have a look at a calculations sheet for a floor or table loom you have um, you have a certain amount it's usually 14 to 18 inches of waste and it's just termed as waste but that waste can come under different categories like why is it waste well one reason can be that you can't weave right to the end of the warp um, another reason can be things like this it's allowing for you for the fact that you're going around pegs and that sort of thing so no you don't have to calculate for that separately and you don't have to worry about it as long as you put in those waste calculations in the initial calculations you'll be absolutely fine all right so we're nearly to the end of the questions but there's a second part of Teresa's question she says that the loom that she has and I'm not going to mention company names just to be fair here she mentions a couple of companies in this question um, but I'm just going to use generic terms instead of the companies so um, I often have trouble with the back pole letting loose when trying to warp so this is on the rigid heddle loom when you're when you're warping the back pole has a break on it and you can wind that backwards but the brake stops it from ever shooting forward it should anyway if it's um, properly functioning um, so she's so Teresa is saying that um, it lets loose when she's warping and everything falls and she has to start over again oh boy how frustrating she has the old style with the wooden block type handle which apparently is not convertible to the new style handles unfortunately um, she also found out that she had a crack at the back rod 
and was told that that was, comes from over-tightening when warping. My husband has repaired that for me and I'm trying to move forward warping a little looser. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Well, yes and no, but I don't have an older loom and I can imagine perhaps with some of the older ones that, I mean, the reason that they replaced the some of the fittings with metal and plastic instead of the old wood that they had is that it's stronger and more effective. Um, I think it's a shame if there is something wrong with your pawl and brake system, um, but that just may happen with older looms at times. And yes, it may not be fixable for all looms. So it really sounds like there's something wrong with your brake. Um, I don't know, it sounds like your husband's a little bit handy. I don't know if he's had a look at it and seen if he can fix it up somehow or do some sort of hack on it. But I'm not that familiar, familiar with the old um, wooden block ones because they're really from some time ago and now only the updated versions are sold. Um, Teresa, if you can't come to some sort of resolution with this, I would probably suggest saving up for a new loom. I know that's not a great solution to the problem. Um, but also something just came to me just now. If you have a guild in your area, a weaving guild, um, sometimes there'll be people there, I'm sure there'd be people there who are using that older style of rigid head or loom and they could perhaps advise you as to whether it's in any way fixable or whether there's some sort of hack that you could do. Try that first. If all else fails, it may have to be a new loom, which is unfortunate, but sometimes things do break beyond repair. The last question comes from Jenny and it's very similar to one that I've already answered about what inspired you to live simply to create a beautiful life through family, the land and craft. Well, I didn't talk much about my family and craft before, um, but this is really a very deep topic because contained within that question is almost like asking me how I became the person that I am currently. And that's a pretty deep question, you know. Um, I'm not going to give my life story or my life's journey up until now, nearly 44 years later. I guess the most simple way for me answering that is my faith, my Christian faith and my faith in God is the reason that I do everything that I do and the reason that I am who I am now as opposed to who I used to be. And yes, life has been a long journey of learning and I'm still learning and changing all the time. But I think when you have faith and you come from the perspective of wanting to spend your life serving God, uh, there is so much grace and beauty that can come out of that. And also if you give your life to God and let him take control of what happens, he will take you to all kinds of amazing places that is almost unlimited because he is, you're allowing him to work through you. Just like the other question, I could spend a long time talking about this, but I think it's about time to wrap up this video. So if you watch to the end, thank you once again. I'm very grateful for all of you people who are prepared to sit there and watch me and listen to me and, and learn from me and know that I'm learning from all of you all of the time and that you are blessing me in the most major way as well. Oh, just before I go, um, I did want to tell you that I do have a project coming up for the channel. It's going to be separate to my online school. It's going to be here on YouTube, so everyone will be able to access it. I've got some yarn on order, but don't hold your breath because the post is very slow here at the moment. But um, I, do I am really excited about this project that I've got for you. It will be suitable for beginners but it will be fun enough that more experienced weavers might want to have a go at it too. It'll be a rigid heddle project. And I'll give you a little hint that it's inspired by the current times, but hopefully not in an icky way. <laughs> My inspiration for this project was to bring beauty to an everyday practice. That's all the hints I'm giving. Until next time, happy weaving. It's from my log cabin ta It's from my log cabin table what?